Well, today we um, are continuing the series that we've been in now for the last seven weeks called The Assignment, uh, Unleashing the Movement. And for those of you new, I always like to take your minute or two right at the top and just kind of give you a brief uh, uh, kind of overview of where we've been. This series really has three phases. In fact, today we're entering into phase three. So, so phase one, we were looking at this assignment that Jesus has given us as a church that when he left, he said his assignment was we go into all the world and share the message of Christ with those who don't know him so they could come to faith, they could come to follow him. And so we spent several weeks talking about that assignment. Uh, uh, secondly, we talked about uh, the specific assignment that we believe God has given us as a church that I just mentioned to enlarge, refresh our campus for the people God is bringing and he will continue to bring as we join him in his movement, his mission to uh, seek and save the lost as he defined it. Uh, and then now this third phase, we're moving into phase number three, which is going to last this week and then two more weeks. And, and we're going to be talking about having, how to have uh, significant spiritual conversations with people who are not yet Christ followers. We all have our one lives. We're, we're all up to, up to this point in this series. We've talked about things like the importance of, of investing uh, re- our, our time into relationships with people who don't know Christ. We've talked about how to build relationships that are, are real, uh, authentic. We love people well. And we said that the time will come when they will ask questions about uh, wh- what we believe or why we do what we do or what do Christians believe or what does the Bible say. And so we want to be able to address those questions. And so this part of the series, we're going to be focusing into how to have significant conversations uh, with people who are kind of seeking after God or people that God is seeking after uh, in their life. And so today, a uh, topic on the table, we want to talk about the message that God has called us to deliver. Uh, often we call that message the gospel, right? So, so what is the gospel? And what I'm going to suggest today is that often what we think of is the gospel, not that it's not true, not that it's not accurate, but that the, the actual message that God has asked us to deliver is much bigger than what we actually call the gospel, that we've often kind of truncated the gospel, if you will. And so uh, we want to talk today about what is the gospel. Uh, we want to look at a passage of scripture that kind of helps us understand the gospel. And then we want to talk about some implications, how that works out in, in both our lives and the lives of those we're sharing Christ with. So today is very much uh, not just a message about what to share with those far from God. It's very much a message for us who are Christ followers to understand what does it mean really at the core to be a follower of Jesus. And so if you have your uh, note sheet there, I uh, want you to open it up, and there's a section that's called uh, The Gospel, What Is It? And that's where I want to start. So uh, when, when we use the word gospel in our culture, it's often used in a wide variety of ways. Uh, in Christian circles, we often use it as sort of code language to describe the plan of salvation. You might describe it that way. Uh, and so the, the, the idea that we need to accept Christ as our personal Savior uh, in order that we'd have eternal life, something like that. We, we might call that the gospel. So if I said, hey, do you share the gospel with this person? Uh, you might think that, that that's what I'm talking about. And Christ died for your sins. Uh, and if you accept as your personal Savior, then you, you can be saved and go to heaven when you die, have eternal life. But what we're going to see today is that the gospel as used in the Bible by Jesus and the apostles, it is a much bigger concept. It incorporates that, but it's much bigger uh, than that. And so what I want to do is start by talking about the word gospel itself and, and what it means in its first century context. Um, what I want to do is I want to do a little Greek work with you right here, a little bit more than usual. Now, I know that there are some of you that when I say Greek, you check your uh, iPhone. Uh, so I want you to hang in there because today we're actually going to be using this word Uh, So I want you to write a word down, okay? This is the word for gospel in the New Testament. It's the Greek word euangelion. I'm going to spell it for you. I'm going to do my best to spell it in English. So it's uh, E-U-A-N-G-E-L-I-O-N, okay? E-U-A-N-G-E-L-I-O-N, something like that. Very close, okay? Okay. Uh, epsilon, oopsilon. So, okay, so so this word is made up of a couple words or or parts of words. The first two letters, the word E-U, that's pronounced U. um, And and we actually see this prefix showing up in English. Uh, For example, uh, we we talk about uh, eugenics. 
uh, or we talk about a euphemism, right? So a euphemism is where you, you come up with a better way of something that makes it sound better than it really is. And so uh, U stands for good. Uh, the word uh, angelon at the end is the word for message or messenger. So this is, for example, where we get the word angel from. An angel is a messenger. Uh, the word for angel is angelos in, in the New Testament. So, so a U uh, uh, angelion, you put those together, it's good what? It's good It's a good message, right? It, it's a good news. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a news flash. Uh, but here's what I want you to catch, that in the ancient world, the word gospel wasn't necessarily a religious term at all. In fact, more often than not, it wasn't. It was, a, it was often a secular term just to describe any kind of good news. So if you have a, a new baby uh, that's born and you send out birth announcements, you could send out the euangelion of the, your baby's uh, birth. Uh, if you uh, got married, you send out marriage announcements. It's the euangelion of your marriage. Uh, if there's a, a major military victory, the euangelion comes in, newsflash, you know, t- uh, TV breaks, newsflash, you know, we just won the war in, in wherever. Uh, and so euangelion was a very secular term, um, and, and, but it, it, uh, in fact, in one place, it's even used to describe like a sale on anchovies, you know, so it's like uh, euangelion, you know, Vaughn's having anchovies on sale. So, um, so it's a very, uh, it's a secular term, it's, it's a general term. Uh, But it has a special meaning, uh, especially in the Roman Empire, a special uh, kind of most important meaning meaning is it's tied to uh, the news of the emperor, the Caesar. So the euangelion was often tied to important news about the uh, Caesar. So remember, in the ancient world, Caesars were considered to be gods, okay? So like Augustus Caesar, who was the Caesar when Jesus was born, uh, he was often referred to as the savior of the world. Uh, he, he was referred to as the one who brought this age of peace and prosperity. And so if you were a Roman citizen, you were expected to go and worship Caesar. You would go to a temple of Caesar worship, just like the temple of Aphrodite or different things. You would burn, uh, you'd burn incense to the Caesar who was considered a god, and you would say these words as you burn them. You'd say, Caesar is what? Anyone know? Caesar is Lord. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And so Caesar is Lord. And so, so, uh, so uh, news that was big news that was tied to the Caesar were, were euangelions. And so, for example, when a new heir to the throne was born, when the heir would ascend uh, of come of age, when the heir would actually take the throne, messengers would be sent out through the Roman Empire with the euangelion, the good news that Caesar, a new Caesar has taken uh, the throne or whatever. So what I want you to catch is that in the ancient world, the word euangelion was first of all often just a secular term, usually not spiritual term. It was often tied to political, the political uh, uh, realm of the Caesar in Rome. So here's what I want you to catch. I want you to see what a perfect word this was for Jesus to pick up and the apostles to pick up when Jesus came and he announced the euangelion of the kingdom. That's what he did. He came, as we'll look later in Mark chapter 1, that he came, his message, he he announced the gospel of the kingdom, the euangelion of the kingdom. So the message was that the kingdom of God that had been promised by the prophets in the Old Testament, that one day uh, a a, a great king who was the son of David would arise up and he would rule over all of earth. He would destroy all that's evil. Uh, He would bring in an area of unparalleled peace, justice, prosperity. The kingdom of God would come to earth, new heavens, new earth, lion lays down with the lamb. That whole kingdom of God scenario, that's in in the first century when a Jew hears the word kingdom of God, That's what comes to their mind. And so Jesus comes and he announces the euangelion of the kingdom, that a new king has come, a new kingdom has come. And you can understand why this was a threat to Rome. You can understand why uh, Jesus was crucified as king of the Jews for this this crime of high treason. You can understand why the uh, Christians were seen as a threat because they were announcing a new kingdom, a new euangelion, announcement of a new king. And so that's some background uh, on the language and, and on kind of the concept of, of euangelion, of gospel, okay? Now, what I want to do next is I want to go to a passage in the New Testament where the gospel is clearly defined. 
And so it's, it's probably the most important passage in the New Testament. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'd like you to turn there if you would. Now, as you're turning there, uh, let me set the stage. Uh, what's happening is in the church at Corinth, there, uh, there, there's a group of new teachers that have come in, and they're challenging teaching about the future resurrection. So what they're saying is that when you die, if you're a Christ follower, you'll go to be with Jesus. You'll live forever. You will have eternal life. But you'll never receive a physical body left. You'll be a disembodied spirit for all eternity. And this was the popular way of thinking in Greek culture at the time. And so it kind of was infiltrating its way into the church. And so Paul's addressing that. He says, let's think about this. Let's go back to the core message of Jesus. Let's go back to the euangelion of Jesus. And, and let's kind of re refresh our minds of what that's about. Uh, and so in, in this context, he's going to lay out the gospel, the euangelion. So here we go. Chapter 15 and verse 1. He says, now brothers, I want to remind you of the euangelion I preached to you, which you receive and on which you have taken your stand. In other words, you based your life upon it. And by this euangelion, this announcement, this news, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Obviously, you have to continue to believe it. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, and scholars tell us that this term in Greek, what I received, is actually a way of saying, uh, this is sort of the official teaching uh, of the apostles of Jesus, the, the message of Christ, the gospel. Paul says, what I received, this official message, I passed on to you as of first importance. And, here, and so here we go. Here's the gospel, right? Paul's going to give us an outline, a summary, a cliff notes of the gospel. And so here we go. First of all, that Christ died for our sins. Okay? And it was according to the scriptures. In other words, it was as prophesied in the Old Testament. And secondly, that he was buried. So he really died. And then third, that he was raised on the third day so that he was resurrected, a real body. Of course, uh, his uh, closest companions, they saw him. They had dinner with him. They touched him. Uh, it was a real body. It wasn't just embodied spirit. Uh, and he said this was also according to the scriptures, also prophesied. And then after that, he appeared to the apostle Peter. Then he appeared to the 12 disciples. So, so that's the gospel. So, so then from this point on, uh, Paul's going to give other post-resurrection experiences. And so he's, it's not just to the 12. He appeared to actually uh, 500 brothers at a single time. Uh, and so he's just kind of laying out the case, okay? But the core, res the core gospel is that Christ died for our sins uh, according to the scriptures he was buried, really died. Uh, he was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. Uh, and then he was seen. That, he says, that's the gospel. Now, if you skip down to verse 11, he says, whether then it was I or they, the apostles, uh, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. Okay, so, so there's the gospel. So what Paul has done is, is that um, he has uh, uh, taken a summary and says, let's wrap, put it in a nutshell, uh, this is the gospel. So here's what I want you to catch. As we are out there having conversations with people, as we're sharing Christ when they ask questions, our one life says, this is kind of an outline of the gospel. But here's what I want you to catch. It is only an outline. I want you to think back to school. Uh, I want you to think back to English classes. I know this is painful for some of you, but let's travel back. And you remember when we were taught how to outline? You remember that like Roman numeral one and then Roman numeral two? But then under each top Roman numeral, there would be several subsets, right? There would be like, uh, like uh, a capital letter A, and then under capital letter A, you, you'd indent and be the, just the regular number one, and then under that, a small letter A. You remember this, how this works? And remember, the rule of an outline is that everything under that top level it all is just an explanation of the top level. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a filling out of the details, right? So here's what I want you to catch. This gospel that Paul is laying out for us, it, it's the cliff notes. It's a summary. It's like an outline with about four points. 
And, and he's, he's expecting that we understand what fills it in. So Paul is assuming that we know two things, which is a bad assumption. Number one, he's assuming we know our Old Testament. Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands. Number two, he's, he's assuming we know our New Testament. Okay? And, and so when, when Paul describes the gospel, it's almost like code language because he's just making this statement. He's assuming that we, we kind of know what those words or what those phrases mean. And so here's what's happened. Often in our culture today, especially as, as American kind of evangelical Bible-believing Christians, we, we have often misunderstood the gospel or kind of missed the fullness of the gospel because we've been told, well, here's what the gospel is. And, and so, uh, and then we read this summary in the light of what we've been told and, and we kind of miss so much. It's not so much, and I want to be clear on this, it's not so much that what we've been told is wrong as that it's incomplete, okay? That, that the gospel that Jesus brought, the gospel of the apostles, was so much more full-bodied, so much more uh, beautiful, so much more compelling, so much more powerful than often what comes to our mind when we hear the word gospel today. So what I want to do today is take some time and unpack uh, this, this gospel that Paul has laid out here, this simple gospel, and, and say, how would a first century Jew have heard this? How, how did the first uh, century Christians at Corinth, where Paul had been for a year and a half teaching them the gospel, how would they have heard this? How would they have understood this? And so we get a more full-blown understanding of this message that we're called both to follow and to share with others, all right? Now, the way to get at this, then, is there on your note sheet, there's a section it's called uh, the gospel, uh, the rest of the story. And so what I want to do just to get at this is it's going to make a couple statements about the gospel and then unpack them to help us understand what the gospel of Jesus uh, really is in all of its uh, glory or just a full, more full-blown uh, description. So here's statement number one. The first statement is, is the gospel is more than personal salvation. See, see, often when we read this description of the gospel, Christ died for our sins, he, according to the scriptures, he was buried, uh, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then he was seen. We read that, and because of what we've been taught or the way we've been raised, we read that as the gospel is a message of personal salvation. Uh, Christ died for you, have you accepted him as your personal savior uh, so that you could be forgiven and go to heaven when you die? Okay, and so that we, we read that code language, and that's what we insert in the code. You see what I'm saying? Like, we get the code, then we interpret the code. This is what the code means. What I'm suggesting is that it's very different than the early church would have read it, what they, the, what they would have heard. And what I want to do is break down this simple gospel into four words or four phrases, okay, that, that I think, and, and then we're going to unpack, like, what they would have heard, what Paul meant when he said this. And I think by the time we're done, then we'll have a much richer understanding of what is the message of the gospel. So number one, let's start with the first word. I want you to write down the word Christ, okay? Now, this is important, that uh, often when we hear the word Christ, and I mentioned this last week, but it's, it, it's something we need to repeat over and over because it just happens uh, without us even thinking about it. When we hear the word Christ, uh, we think of Christ as Jesus' last name, okay? So like he went to the DMV, <laughs> you know, the woman who's not even looking up, first name, you know, Jesus, second name, Christ, okay, great, you know? So his driver's license comes out, Jesus Christ, okay? He gets arrested, sir, you're weaving back there, I don't know, you're praying or what? Uh, yeah, I was casting out a demon. Uh, uh, anyway, um, Oh, like, oh, Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, Christ is not a name. Christ is a title, okay? So uh, as, as time goes on, even in the New Testament, because he's referred to so often as Jesus Christ, that we begin to use it sort of as a name, and that's okay. 
But, but you have to understand that, that, Jesus, that Christ is a title. And, it, and what the title means, Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. Okay? So what Messiah in Hebrew is Christ in Greek. They both mean the anointed one. And so what, what this refers to, uh, if you're a Jew and you hear the word Christ in the first century, this, this, just, this single word conjures up your outline. I'm telling you, just, your outline just starts filling in. Like, I, like this, you have this one word, Christ, it, your outline just becomes huge. Be, because it's sort of like today, like if I say the president of the United States, right? Your outline starts filling in. Because you're Americans, you understand the authority, the power, the influence, everything that it means to be president of the United States. Well, in the same way, for a first century Jew, when you say the Christ, I mean, that comes with a truckload of information. Uh, The Christ is the Messiah, the son of David, the great king who will one day come and bring the kingdom of God to earth, turn all wrongs to right, uh, destroy all that's evil, uh, usher in a time of unparalleled peace, prosperity, and justice for all that will last forever. The new heavens and the new earth. That's what you hear when you hear the word Christ. That's who Christ is. And, and so we don't hear that. We just go last name. You know, we know it's the Jesus guy, right? But that's what they hear. This is why, you know, for example, when uh, Jesus asked his followers, his disciples, you remember this, he said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say this, some say that. He said, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And you remember what Peter said? He said, you are the Christ. Not, not Christ last name. You are the Christ. You are the king of Israel. You know? So when Jesus comes announcing his kingdom, the kingdom of God, if you're a first century Jew, all of that comes with it. All, all that comes with it. And so the first thing we have to understand is this statement about what we believe, the gospel, it's all about Christ. It's about his life. It's about his miracles. It's about his death. It's about his resurrection. Paul had taught these Corinthians for a year and a half about Christ. We'll look at later a passage where he talks about the Last Supper. They knew the story of Jesus. And so nutshell version, Christ, okay, the great king who has come to earth, okay, that's where we start this, 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 the gospel is about this great king. Secondly, though, it's that this king died for our sins. So the second piece of this little creed, uh, most scholars believe that 1 Corinthians 13, what we're reading here is the first creed of Christendom. This is what it means to be a Christian. And so the, the second part of this creed is that Christ died for our sins. Okay, that's the second piece. Christ died for our sins. Now, this in itself was a huge shocker when Jesus came because no one expected the Christ to die. He was going to rule forever. And so the gospel is the king has come, but unexpectedly, he didn't take over right now that he died for our sins. Now, died for our sins, that's code, right? There's a story behind that. Let's fill in the outline. What's the outline? Well, that, you know, died for our sins. Let's just kind of, uh, let's fill that out. Well, uh, we're the rebel race. We'll, we'll see this later. Uh, we're the rebel race. We, we rebelled against our true king back in the garden. As a result, death has come on to the whole race. It's why we die. And so God starts this plan of rescue mission. And he raises up the nation of Israel. And he promises that through that nation, he will bring a great king who will rescue us. The great king, he comes and he dies. He dies for your sin. He dies for my sin. He dies for the sin of the world. And as a result of that, even though we're the rebel race, there is a way for us to be forgiven and restored to God. And this is the good news, right? That it doesn't matter what you've done. You know, you're sitting here today. Maybe it's your first time here at Rocky Peak. It's the first time you're here. You're you're even nervous being in church. Because you're afraid that maybe lightning's going to come down and strike the place. Just, your past is so, and so you're not sure that you're worthy. You're not sure that God can want a relationship with you. You're not sure that he can forgive you after all you've done. The good news of the gospel 
is it doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done that our king has come to die in our place. Excuse me, uh, I will die for you. You get credit for my life. There's this great exchange that happens. And so you can be made right with God. It has nothing to do with you. It has, it's all a gift, right? So all that is com- contained in that phrase, died for our sins. That's what Paul means. Okay? Let's move on to the, the third phrase. Third phrase is according to the scriptures. Right? He died for us according to the scriptures. Now, this is an important statement. Often as 21st century Christians, we think that the story of Jesus started with Jesus. It didn't. Uh, if if, if the Bible is a novel, Jesus is like the last chapter, not the first chapter. Uh, think of the story that God is telling like a mini-series. And it all leads up to the final episode, who is Jesus. Okay? Everything that comes before it leads up to him. But the story is incomplete without him. You see, it's, like, like it's, not like just, it's not like, okay, God was working with Israel. That was plan A. And that didn't really work out so well. So scrap that. Let's come up with a new plan B. Okay, that, that's, not, that's the way it is. It's like from time immemorial, God has promised to rescue the race through the Messiah, through the tribe of David. It's, this has been part of the plan. And so what Paul is saying is this is not some newfangled thing that's come along. It's according to the scriptures. This is what was promised and planned all along, this, this, this plan of Jesus. And then the fourth thing, the fourth piece is that he was raised from the dead. Okay, let's fill in the outline. What we learned last week is that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was not simply a one-off miracle to impress us and show that Jesus really was the Son of God. It was that, but it was more than that. And what we learned last week is the resurrection of Jesus is the first fruits of a whole new harvest that's coming. That, that the king, Jesus is the king, and he's come to restore all of creation and restore it to his, to his father, to be the true king who rules over all things. And so one day he's coming back to usher in new heavens, new earth, and we will all receive, if we're followers of Christ, a new body to live in the new creation forever. And so the resurrection of Jesus wasn't just about Jesus, it's about all of us. He was resurrected for you. He was resurrected for me. We will be resurrected in him because of our connection. And so the resurrection points forward to this whole new creation that's coming, the new heavens and the new earth. Are you following me in this? Okay, so, so here is the gospel then. The gospel is rebel race rebels against our true king. As a result, experiences death Uh, destruction goes our own way. God raises up the nation of Israel, promises that a great king will come who will restore all of creation under his rule again, that through the life, the teaching, the miracles of Jesus, his death and resurrection, we see what, we get a glimpse of that kingdom. What will it be like when the true king comes? And we see, we see, we see people heal. We see the blind seeing. We see sinners transformed. We see crippled people walking. We see, uh, uh, restoration coming wherever it's it's a picture of what is coming in the future when he rules over all you see this is all part of the story and then he goes to the cross and dies and raises again the first fruits of a new creation that comes that's coming you see that's the gospel that's the gospel it's the story of the king and so the gospel is much more than just have you been saved have i been saved have you accepted jesus have i been accepted jesus now catch this That's a very important part of the story, right? Like we all have to decide what we're going to do with this new king. The new king has come. He's given us this offer of amnesty. He says, I don't care what you've done or where you've come from. Uh, I'm offering you forgiveness uh, if you lay down your arms and you come and you follow me, right? So we have to decide that. And that becomes the point of the most important point of the gospel for us. But what I want you to catch is that the gospel is much bigger than you or me, our personal salvation. The gospel is the rule of God, the kingdom of God coming again to planet earth and all of creation coming under its true king. Does that make sense? This makes sense? Amen. Okay. So, um, 
so, so you say, well, Mike, how do you know that, right? Like, like how do you know that this 1 Corinthians 15, the first few verses, how do you know that's truly a summary? Like, like how, how do you know it's not just personal salvation? And, and, and this, how do you know that? Well, there's a lots of ways to know that. One way is just by reading the rest of the New Testament, right? But we don't even have to do that. All we have to do is go a few verses down in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul takes the gospel and begins to unpack it, like I just did. And so there in your note sheet, just to make this easy, uh, I put it there in the New Living Translation, chapter 15. And so here is Paul, just a few verses later, what were nine verses later than when we left off, and he begins to unpack the outline. And he says, well, Christ, and remember, that's Messiah, King. The King has been raised from the dead, and he is the first of a great what? harvest. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is not just about Jesus, it's about all of creation. So he's the first of a great harvest of all who have died. And so you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now what's he talking about? Who's he talking about? Adam, right? And so remember, we talked about Jesus dying for our sins, and the code for that was that we're the rebel race, and we rebelled in Adam, and we've all rebelled in our own way, and we're all under death. Okay, that's what he's just explaining. He says, You see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection of the dead has what? Has, let's say it again, has what? It's begun. See, the the resurrection of Jesus is the first step of this new new, uh, creation is coming. And so just as that, through another man, uh, uh, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. We, We will be taken with him in that resurrection but there's an order to this resurrection. A Messiah was raised as the first of the harvest. Okay, he was the first step. And then all who belong to Christ, to Messiah, will be raised when he comes back, okay, when at the end of time. And then after that, the end will come. When he will turn the what? The kingdom. See that kingdom language? He'll turn the kingdom uh, over to God the Father having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. So, so, here, here, so here's, here's what you got going here. You've got uh, the, the, uh, the son rises from the dead. He ascends to the right hand of the father. He becomes Lord of the universe, right? And, and so we're told in scripture, there will come a time when the father will say, it's time and Jesus will return and he will usher in the fullness of his kingdom. And after all evil has been destroyed, and after all that's left is justice and righteousness and and peace, he will turn it back to his father and say, Father, you are now back in control as you were supposed to. The father's king has come, and he's taken over uh, the cosmos again. Do you see what's going on here? So this is uh, the gospel. And so um, there in your note sheet, I put a quote from John Dixon This week in your life groups, you're going to be reading a great, it's a fantastic chapter, but I have to warn you, it's a little bit heady. Uh, It's about 30 pages, so it'll be a little bit more than normal. But the the chapter is called, What is the Gospel? And all he's going to do is he's going to do a more thorough looking of Scripture than we have time for today to walk you through, here's what the Gospel is. Uh, And and so he's going to do a great job of that. but here in the intro to that book, he, sa- he says this. He says, the gospel is the announcement. Remember, it's the newsflash. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the euangelion. It's, it's the, uh, the message that God has revealed his kingdom. In other words, through Jesus, we've, the, he's come. He's revealed what his kingdom looks like. And he's opened it up to sinners, you know, like you and me, uh, through the birth and the teaching and the miracles and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So through, through, through Jesus, the kingdom comes. We see what the kingdom looks like and what it means to enter his kingdom. And he says, who will one day return to overthrow evil and consummate the kingdom for eternity. So there is the gospel message, all right? So, so this is important because uh, uh, like next week, we're gonna be talking about making the most of every conversation and, and how when we're having uh, conversations with non-believers that we want to be able to speak the gospel 
but that doesn't necessarily, we tell them the whole story, right? That the part of the gospel may be that a person may say, well, I don't know if I could ever be, you know, good enough uh, for God after what I've done. And it's like, well, let me tell you a story about Jesus and how he illustrated the kingdom. And so this one time he met this woman and she'd been married five times and she was currently not living. And, and let me tell you what Jesus talked to her about. And see, what we're doing is we're, we're illustrating the gospel. Like this is what the kingdom looks like when the kingdom comes. This is what the king looks like. This is the one who's come after you. And so if we understand this uh, kind of broad outline of the gospel and how it gets filled in, we'll be much better prepared to have just kind of conversations as they come up with people that we're uh, discussing Christ with, all right? So, uh, so that's number one, that the gospel is more than personal salvation. Number two, the gospel is more than invitation. So, so catch how I'm, I'm putting this. I'm, I'm not saying the gospel isn't invitation because it is invitation. I mean, this is the gospel that the Messiah has come, the King has come. He's died for your sins and my sins. He invites us into a relationship regardless of what we've done or where we've been. He wants to give us a whole new life. That's the gospel. And inherent in the gospel is invitation. And so receive Christ uh, as your true King and Come to Christ and give your life to him and experience this new life that he has. And so the gospel is for sure invitation. Okay, I want to be real clear on this. But what I'm saying is the gospel is more than invitation. The gospel is not just invitation. The gospel also is command. Okay? And that command is to repent. So often we we think of the gospel as hey, uh, God loves you. Uh, he has a wonderful plan for your life. He has come. Christ died for your sins so you could be forgiven. He would love for you to come and join him and to be saved. And, and so why don't you come, right? So, so that we think of that, okay? And, and that everything I just said is true. It's, it's gospel's invitation. But what we often forget to say somewhere in the conversation, and I'm not talking about a single conversation. I'm talking conversation over time. What we often forget to say is what happens if you don't come. See, the gospel is not just invitation, it is command. The message of the gospel is that the king has come. He has this incredible offer of amnesty, but that's the good news. The bad news is what happens if you reject the offer. Because the offer is delivered by a king. And see, this is what we often, we often miss. Like we, we, we read that Corinthians passage. This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, rose again, you know, for, uh, according to the scriptures. And, and what we miss is we miss the obvious. But let's go back. Who died for our sins? Right, Christ. Right, let's say it again. Who died for our sins? Christ. What does Christ mean? Messiah. What does Messiah mean? The king, right? So at the very start of this creed is the king has died for our sins. And by definition, if you want to enter into relationship with the king, what do you need to do? You lay down your arms. You get on your knees. You bow the knee. You say, I am so sorry for my rebellion against you. I've been running my own life. I've been being my own king. I've done all kinds of things that violate the laws of your kingdom. I'm, I'm guilty. I deserve to die. Thank you for your offer. I bow the knee. I offer my services. I, like a knight in olden days, I, I bow now to be knighted by you, to be part of your movement. To be, We switch sides. You see, see how this works? And, and there is no salvation apart from this. You're right? There's no way that you say, hey, I'm really thankful, O king, you died for me, but just so you know, I'd like to receive that offer of forgiveness, but I still want to fight against you on the other side of the spiritual war. So if it's all the same to you, thanks for the amnesty, I'm going to still fight you, fight your kingdom, live for myself, I'm going to fight for the kingdom of Satan and what he's doing, and so I hope you're good with that. You see, he's like, uh, no, I'm not good with that, right? 
And, and this is why when Jesus comes and announces his kingdom, the very first thing he says is repent. Because there is no salvation apart from repentance, aren't you, king? And so there in your note sheet, for example, in Mark chapter 1, uh, where this is the start of Jesus' ministry, and, and Mark's summarizing his message. And so it says, Jesus went into Galilee, preaching the euangelion of the gospel. Uh, it's the euangelion, it's the word there. Proclaiming the euangelion of God. And here's what he says, the time has come. Well, what do you mean the time has come? Well, Jesus, uh, the time prophesied in the Old Testament by the prophets when the kingdom of God would come to earth and the Messiah would come. That's what he said. The time has come. And he said the kingdom of God, remember how Jews would hear that, the kingdom of God is near. And so he says, what's the first thing he says we have to do? Repent. Repent. What's the second thing he says we have to do? Believe. Believe. He says, okay, so there's two things he says you need to do to enter into the kingdom. He says repent and believe the gospel, the euangelion. Two things, repent and, and believe. Now, here's the problem. Let's talk about repentance. Repentance, at its core, has to do with turning. And so, before Jesus, we run our own kingdom. Like, think of your life as a kingdom. You run your own kingdom. You, you do your own thing. Uh, you're often pursuing things that are opposite of what God would want, his, his righteous kingdom, right? And so, and so, to repent means to change directions. It means to turn to God uh, in repentance, and we, we ask him to forgive us, and we're going we're gonna to follow him. So it's gonna ch- we were going this way, right? To repent means to stop, turn around, and go this way. So I was running my own life, running my own kingdom. I was acting as you didn't exist. I was violating your laws, your commands, or whatever. Uh, I was going this way, and, and so now uh, I need to repent, turn around, and come back and say, I was wrong. Get on my knees. Jesus, I'm sorry. You are my true king. Will you forgive me? I receive your amnesty. I become part of your movement. I, switch over, I step over the line. I become part of your kingdom. You see, that's what it means to become a Christ follower, to become part of the kingdom. Now, here's the problem is notice there's two things there. There's repent and believe. In the United States, in our Western form of gospel teaching, so many times we've only given half the story. We don't tell people to repent. We just tell them to believe, right? So we say, here's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. If you ask him into your heart as a personal savior at camp when you're 12 years old and you go down and you throw your something in the fire, you are in, Right? Here's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. You raise your hand. You ask Jesus in your heart. You go live like hell. It's fine. You're saved. (laughs) Hello? The gospel is the king has come to restore the kingdom, right? You don't enter the kingdom without surrendering to the king. It's the way it works. And so Here's the thing. The early church had no problem with this. They got this. They, they got the language. They, 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 they got this. In fact, in the early church, when you, you, when you became a Christian, the first thing you did was get baptized. Now, now we often wait forever, you know. Uh, we often like, yeah, it's a symbolic thing, blah, blah. You know, whatever. Uh, in the early church, when you came to Christ, the way that you said, I'm becoming a Christian, is you got baptized, And so when you went to get baptized, you had to make a confession of faith. In other words, this is what I believe. And guess what that confession of faith was? The confession of faith is that Jesus is Lord. Yeah, or king, same. But it's Jesus is Lord. Now, think of their context, the Roman Empire. Who is the Lord of the Roman Empire? Caesar, you bow down to him. You burn incense. He's a God. And so for the Christian, you say, no, no, no. Caesar is not my Lord. Uh, There is a new king who's come to town. He brought the kingdom. He revealed the kingdom. He showed us what it was like to live in his kingdom. He died and he rose again so he could enter his kingdom. He's ascended to the right hand of God. He is Lord of the cosmos. He's coming again to restore all creation. And Jesus is now my Lord. You see? That's what it means to be a Christ follower. That you have said, he is my Lord. And so, so what happens in the early, they were not confused about this. So you look, for example, on your note sheet in Romans chapter uh, 10, Paul is talking about the gospel message, this message of faith that he shares. And he says, this message is the very message about faith that we preach. 
And he says, here's the message. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. In other words, Messiah died for our sins in our place. God raised him from the dead. First fruits, that whole package, right? He says, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. But notice that little word, if, right? What happens if you don't confess Jesus as Lord? Well, you're not saved, you, you see? And so, just to be clear about this, that I'm not at all saying that the gospel is you come to Christ, Jesus, your Lord, and you never sin, right? Of course, we all, we're all going to mess up. We're all going to screw up. The, you know, you look at the, the, the followers of Jesus, you know, uh, Peter and the gang, they were always doing stupid things but they never stopped following Jesus, right? Like he, he was their Lord. They didn't like, hey, no, we're not into that anymore, right? We're not, okay, we're, we're, okay so, so this is what it means to be a follower. It's more the invitation, it is command. And it's important that we understand this not only for our own lives, but it's important as we share the message of Christ with those who don't know him. Because can I tell you something? That in our country today, there are churches that are full of people who think that they're saved and going to heaven because they said a prayer sometime 18 years ago that have never really surrendered their life to Jesus as their Lord, and they're living in false security, right? They're going to be like when Jesus said, okay, he said, hey, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, and I will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you because you didn't do the will of my Father. Like you never surrendered your life to me. And so as Christ's followers, it's important for us to get this starting with ourselves. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It means he's our Lord. We follow him. It's what we do, right? We don't just believe on him. We repent and follow him. We, we, we repent and we believe. That's what we are. But this is important conversation for us to have with our one lives uh, this, as, as we're sharing the gospel of what does it mean to be a Christian that, that somewhere in that conversation, and I'm not saying in every conversation, right? I'm not saying that, okay, the first time you talk to someone, you back up the truck, you dump the whole thing. You know, it's like, turn or burn. Hello, my mic. I'm your neighbor. You know, uh, I'm not saying that. I think in the healthiest relationships where we're sharing Christ, you share Christ over time. You share a little bit here. You share a little bit there. But as you're sharing Christ in the story of the gospel, Part of the story is that Jesus is Lord and that to come to him means to surrender your life to his leadership and that means leaving what's wrong and evil behind. And if we share the message of Christ without sharing that, we're not sharing the whole message. We're not sharing the truth of the gospel. And then you can have people out there that think they're saved because they prayed some prayer at some event, right? And there's no evidence of fruit in their life. There's no evidence of new birth. There's no hunger for God. There's no love for people. There's no hatred of sin. There's nothing to suggest that they've truly been born again. And yet they think because they went forward at this one crusade or whatever the thing was that they're in, you see? And so we need to make sure that we're, we're sharing the whole gospel. And I think when we share the whole gospel, that when people come to Christ, they start off strong and they, they start off, their roots start going deep because they understand the core, what they're doing. There in your note sheet, another quote from uh, Dixon. This is from the book you'll be reading, this, uh, the chapter you're reading this week. Uh, Paul says, I mean, uh, uh, Dixon says, to put it in simple and practical terms, the goal of the gospel preaching and of gospel promoting is to help our neighbors realize and submit to, kings, to God's kingship or lordship in their lives. Simply put, one of the goals of gospel preaching and of gospel promoting is to help those around us acknowledge their sinfulness. So that they understand they're part of this fallen race. They need to be forgiven. And to trust in Jesus' death as the means of their salvation. That's Christ died for our sins. This means that judgment must be part of the gospel. In other words, part of the gospel message is that the good news is if you turn, you'll be forgiven. The bad news, if you don't, there's still a sentence on your, over your life. You're still under judgment. When Christ returns or you go to meet him, you will be judged. You'll be destroyed. That, that's part of this message. It's not just invitation, it's command. You know, when Jesus said repent and believe, guess what? In the Greek, those are imperatives. They're not suggestions. They're commands. 
Um, and so he says, the kingdom of God is coming upon uh, the world precisely to overthrow all that's contrary to God's purposes. And this includes all who have rebelled or sinned against the creator's way. So that's, that's part of the message. The good news is God loves you. He's got a plan for your life, wants to change your life, doesn't care where you've come from or where you've been, but you have to leave the dark side. You have to. You have to leave the dark side. You have to leave the evil behind. You have to stop calling your own shots. You have to start holding on to things that are destructive. You have to. You've got to lay it down and follow Christ. And if you're not willing to do that, then judgment will come and destruction will come. You see, it's part of the gospel. And so what we have today then is in this uh, verses in 1 Corinthians 15, the first few verses, you have this, this broad outline, a very, kind of a very simple outline that helps us to remember what the gospel is when we're sharing that Christ, uh, the Christ, he's the king, right? The king of Israel has come to restore all things. And came, that Christ has come, he's died for our sins. Your life for his life, total forgiveness, uh, total amnesty, all crimes against the king. That he rose again, the first step of a whole new creation and that we need to respond uh, to him in repentance and belief and we enter into his kingdom. And so there is the gospel. Now, today, as we uh, wrap this up, we want to celebrate communion today. And, and, and I want to take just a second to talk about what communion is because communion is really a proclamation of the gospel. In fact, earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Paul talks, he says, you know, when I was with you, he said, I, I talked to you about the last night that Jesus was arrested and how before his death, uh, before he was arrested, that he broke the bread and he said, this is my body, this is my blood, right? So he's saying, uh, he's giving an illustration of what's about to happen. I'm about to die for you, that, that my, my life for yours, I'm about to die for your sins. And then he said this, he said, and as often as you eat this bread or drink this cup, catch this, you proclaim my death until I come. And so every time we celebrate communion, we are proclaiming the gospel, that, that Christ died for our sins, that he rose again, he's coming again to restore all of creation, and, and that we can have forgiveness. And so today, as we go into this time of communion, here's what I'd say. If you're here today and you're a follower of Christ, this is obviously for you. As you go to the communion table, drink deeply of this gift that he's given you. That through his death and resurrection, you've been made totally right with God. He loves you. He's given you his spirit. He's coming again to, to, to restore your bodies uh, to a new creation. The future is bright. Revel in the gospel today as we celebrate communion. If you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Christ, I want to ask you a question. Why not? What is holding you back? Is it that you haven't understood it? Hopefully today you do. Is it you think you're not good enough? Hopefully today you understand the gospel is all about us not being good enough. You don't have to be good enough. That's the whole reason why he died. Are you afraid to give up your old life? Jesus came to give you new life. It's through his resurrection that he will give you the power to follow him and change you and, and give you a whole new life. And so uh, if today you're ready to give your life to Christ, there is no better way than as we pray, we go to the communion tables. I would encourage you, go to the communion tables, receive his body, receive his blood. Uh, ask Christ into your life and say, Jesus, I do believe, I do repent, I surrender my life. I ask you to come and be my true king and to remake my life. And trust me, he will. That as you go to the communion and you ask him to do that, he will do that. And you will become born again. You will become a follower of Christ today. And then I would say this, that if you're here and for whatever reason, You've not yet given your life to Christ, but for whatever reason, you're not ready to give your life to Christ. You know, for whatever the reason, that I would encourage you not to go to the communion table today. Because what we're doing when we go to communion is we're proclaiming the gospel. And if you don't yet believe that Christ died for your sins, you're not yet ready to submit to his kingship in your life, then it kind of becomes a, a, a kind of an act of sort of hypocrisy or misrepresentation to go and take communion. And so as we get up and we all move, uh, just find your place around the room. Find a place to pray or whatever. You have to you know, kind, of, kind of go seek God or, or, or talk to him or whatever you kind of process what you're learning. But we want to go now and, and we want to celebrate the gospel. So would you stand with me? I'm going to lead us in prayer. The band's going to come and play. And then as we normally do, just as they begin to play, I want you to go to 
the, uh, the edges of the room, uh, celebrate the gospel, uh, find a place to pray. Uh, if you're married, go with your wife, your husband, pray together. Uh, just have a time of celebrating the good news that the Savior, the King, has come. Let's pray. Lord, we want to come before you right now, and we just pray that you would meet us in this moment, and you would write this truth of the gospel in our heart, that though we are a rebel race out of your incredible love, you came after us to restore us, to heal us, to make us new, and to save us for the next life that we could live with you in the new heavens and the new earth. And so, God, we pray that you'd meet us now. We pray if there's any here that need to give their life to you, you'd give them the courage right now, the lies that they're hearing in their ears that they can't, they can't, they're not ready, they're not good enough. I just pray you'd help them to break through that, to call out to you to save them, that right now that they would come and, and ask in Jesus' name to be born again and to be forgiven and they would experience the new life in Christ that we've come to know. We pray you'd meet us now as we go and we thank you for the gospel of your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name, amen.